You're listening to All Things 3D, where we talk about the world of fabricating, designing, and capturing in the third dimension. We are not building this country of ours for a day, Teddy Roosevelt said. It is to last through the ages. Earlier this summer, Michelle and I visited Yosemite with our daughters. We came here to celebrate the National Park Service's centennial and to be part of our storied American tradition of conservation and preservation. In August, we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. And since I took office, I have been proud to build on the work of all those giants who came before me to support our natural resources and to help all Americans get out into the great outdoors. One of my most vivid memories of my childhood was visiting Yellowstone when I was 11 years old and seeing bison and moose and bears for the first time. Places like Yosemite make us feel part of something bigger than ourselves. We connect not just with our own spirit, it was something great, the spirit of America itself. Yosemite VR. Hey, everybody. Oh, got one more, Chris. We got one more. This looks like the Grand Canyon. Glacier, Glacier National Park. Ooh, all of the national parks. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. All Things 3D. Today is Friday, September 9th, 2016. It's Week in Review. Yes, it is. So if you're wondering about the two opening videos, the first one was the Oculus. Um, actually, it was not produced by Oculus, uh, another company. But that is a full stereo 360 panoramic uh, of a Yosemite event that uh, President Obama had attended and obviously was part of. And I just watched it last night using my Neo DVR. Uh, <clears throat> Uplay is a pretend Gear VR, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But I felt extremely immersed in it. I mean, I actually felt like I was at Yosemite, except I didn't have to worry about the bugs <laughs> crawling on my skin. Uh, it's part of the authenticity. Yeah. So they're going to have to start we're going to have to have some sort of haptic system that actually <laughs> mimics the bugs now, something yeah. like that, you know, like little bug haptic feedback is what but we You need. remember when, <laughs> when we showed the, the April Fools of the Google, where they call it uh, clear or uh, invisible cardboard or essentially it was a... Oh, like, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> and they were actually... Uh, doing In real life, like, it's yeah. VR. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty cool. Well, I'm okay. wearing my 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 uh, Google my Google Nano VR right now. Oh, wow! Yeah, I'm actually right. in VR. Well, you know, some people think maybe we are in a big simulator. Okay, yeah, that's too lofty for me. Okay, okay. So let's, okay. All right. So the the second video was about. Google Arts and Culture, um, and as you notice, they, this Google Arts and Culture also includes a lot of 360 videos of national parks as well. Uh, behind me is the Google Play for Android, but there is also a version for iOS. Install it, and it has content for not only museums, but uh, national parks, and as I mentioned already, links to 360 videos uh, that are also available on YouTube, but this is a good source to go to. Now, as mentioned, the first one is Stereo 360, so it's more immersive. There's depth to it. Uh, a lot of these in the Google are just standard 360, um, I guess, monoscopic, which essentially is, think of it 
is a cylinder that you're within where the other one is actually with depth information makes you feel like there's some volume to it. Yeah, and which is still cool. I mean, it's not yeah. stereoscopic, but still really, I mean, that's pretty cool stuff. And it, it's just, it's, it's just like the difference between 1080p essentially and 4k or I guess 3d TV and a regular TV. So, yeah. And that's the important thing. And we'll get into a little bit more about how to do that in another show. But essentially, I find in my own experiences in, in developing stereo 360 uh, panoramics that that extra depth information is really what immerses you. And you'll see it more. The problem is it's more expensive. You have to double the number of cameras. And if you're going with 360, if you notice like the GoPro and a few others, there's a reason their arrangement is set up like it is which is about 65 millimeters, about the IPD of eyes uh, between cameras so that you'll have that dual stereo aspect regardless of where you stitch the cameras together. And one of the reasons I mentioned, I, I plan to get a couple of Samsung Gear 360s, which is their spherical camera, which again is only monoscopic. But if you take two of them, you can at least get 180 degrees in forward. So if you only need to look at images in front of you, if you put two of those together side by side. So I'll explain that a little bit later in another episode, but that'll at least give you that ability. And there are many cameras coming out uh, that will have that functionality. They're just not here yet. And I want to do something when I'm on my road trip and not next week, but the week after um, to Portland and Iowa. So No way. We're going to be in Portland next week too. I won't be next week, the week oh. after. So uh, uh, and on that, the, uh, the, the big part for me that I've realized with the Oculus is what I found what separates the games or the content that's really immersive and kind of the stuff that's semi-immersive um, is sound for me. That does uh, it for I me. Yeah, totally agree it, with you. And, and like, the, we've, you know, we've had a couple of uh, manufacturers on, developers on that deal specifically in 360. And yes, that has come a long way. And I totally agree with you. And this is interesting. And I don't know why nobody has mentioned it. I guess I'll, I'll mention it. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about the new iPhone 7. And why I think if they would have come out with a better screen, that would be probably the most awesome mobile VR component that you could have because the A10 is just a, what would you call it? I would say the fastest SOC or processor out there. And um, I've noticed that even with the previous 6S Plus, that the performance really keeps up with an A20. And this is just going to blow it out the doors. Sadly, the screen is still an IPS, IPS LCD at only 1920 by 1080. Now keep in mind the subpixel, remember we had that little episode about what subpixels are, are RGB. So you can actually pack a more dense um, subpixel arrangement. So it's not that, um, uh, what do you want to call it, uh, uh, that much more blocky because you're using 1080p or 1920 versus 2560. I mean that's only about 500 pixels. Um, and the fact is it's in a 5.5 inch screen versus a 5.7 or a six inch screen uh, also makes a difference. But the, the, probably the biggest thing is IPS LCD doesn't have the blackness of AMOLED. So if you're looking at uh, some items, let's say movies and so forth, there's always that glow of the back screen on it that kind of ruins it a little bit. But other than that, I think, you know, from my experience, I've been able to create some pretty neat uh, Unity 3 pre-complex. Remember Graveyard? That runs fantastic on it. But the other thing is they took away the headphone jack. And you're probably aware of that, right, Chris? Yeah, that's weird. And I like, you know, I'm I'm all for eliminating unnecessary things, but this seems like a really weird thing. The one that the one complaint that I've been hearing a lot of that kind of is definitely a big one is the fact that you, you know, so the headphone it comes with a little dongle to plug into, you know, your standard headphone into the, uh, what do they call that? The little five pin connector. Well, Whatever. it's called the lightning port. Lightning yeah. port. But you can't charge your phone and listen to music at the same time <laughs> or well, listen to it, yeah. which is kind of, and then they have this weird Belkin uh, kind of dongle thing. It's, it's kind of, that is the one point, the one thing that I think they really overlooked and, uh, you know, it's kind of weird to me, but I do really love those little earbud things. I think that's pretty, uh, that's, 
I've been I've been saying for a few years now that somebody needs to get their uh, somebody needs to actually make one. I mean, they're a little big. If once they get them, once the next gen comes and they're actually just like a little hearing aid, and you know, I'm hoping that they like let you kind of adjust how much sound you can pass through, so you could actually be walking and have both of them in, and they could actually be like it could be like an augmented reality type thing where you have sound that's overlaid the real world, kind of like the augmented reality glasses, you know? Yeah, I think there's a couple of companies that are creating something as small as you're talking about. The problem is how long do they last? Uh, and they're also quite expensive. So yeah, some people have complained about those new, what do they call them, AirPods or something like that. Well, you know, I'm kind of cheap. I had these these no-name <laughs> brand. Um, actually, I love them. Um, their Bluetooth is a little wonky, but um, they use the, you know, I'm a big fan of silicone. They use silicone, and they're stereo, and I use those all the time. Yeah, they're wired, um, but, and they're black, so I don't think they're as intrusive, and then they fit over the ear. Some people are complaining, well, how are you going to keep those things in? Uh, that'll be something to look at. But let's get back to the point that I made you know what? I think I was on myself. So this is what I use uh, out there if you're listening or watching. Um, they're like 30 bucks and they work very well. And I've been using them for about three months now and, and love Are them. Are they wireless? Yeah, they're Bluetooth. Oh. Yeah. Huh. And then, you know, unlike the, the, and again, we won't spend much time on, what do they call it? The AirPods or whatever. They're wired. So you have to drain. I them. like those AirPod things. I think that that's a step in the right direction for me. Well, that, that's cool. But there are other companies doing that. So look at other things as well. I mean, the other point is they have some, what they call their W chip or something like that, which is just marketing crap. It's still Bluetooth, but I think they do a little bit of different handshaking to make sure it's immediate. I don't know. I haven't tested them. Nobody really has, so we won't know. But getting back to the iPhone 7, the thing that I've come to a realization is that if you remember the iPhone 7 or iPhone 6, I've been using with the structure sensor to provide positional tracking. Guess what port it uses? The lightning port. So the problem is if you're going to want to use earbuds with it, you can't anymore unless somebody creates a dongle or a splitter that allows you to use two devices. I don't know if that'll happen. Um, so yeah, I see a concern. One. Yeah, well, but that's for power. And there are some other products out there that do that. But um, I personally uh, will have to see on that now. One caveat is that they will have stereo um, capability now, so you'll be able to at least use that and um, with a, another device. But that's where I see a problem with them removing the headphone button. Now I just plug in my earbuds, and I'm able to see, as you mentioned, directional sound, which will not be as, uh, what do you want to call it, as immersive if you just use little stereo speakers on it. But in saying that, the Nexus also has used, the Nexus phones like the 6 and the 6P also use the dual or side speakers. And I find it pretty immersive. So you don't necessarily have to earbud. So, I'll, you know, we'll see. I hope to have my hands on one um, next month so that I'll be able to test it uh, with something else that I'll show you a little bit later. Um, I have what I call the... <coughs> the ODVR Silver Edition, made specifically for the new iPhone 7, and I'll show that off a little bit. I think I, I had some earlier images of it. Okay, well, you know, Chris, I've got a little video that I'm going to show based upon your request. Oh, yeah. This is uh, coming the 19th. This is what I'm really excited about, is this GoPro has their Karma drone. This footage here is why it's relevant to our show being all things 3D is it looks to have some sort of 3D awareness and obstacle avoidance being that it can fly in such a, uh, it must be tiny or something. Uh, that looks okay, pretty so cool, right? 1919, so I guess we better book it on the show, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I just so wanted to it, mention Chris? that. Well, the Karma is their drone that's coming, right? So they've got a uh, they've got a uh, multi copter uh, drone that uh, looks pretty uh, 
pretty fun. Hmm. Looks, uh, yeah, looks very interesting. And it looks like it has some sort of like, uh, like I was saying, like 3D uh, awareness of what it, what's around it. Kind of like maybe like the DJI, um, the Phantom 4, you know, has obstacle avoidance. So, mm -hmm. I mean, to get into some of those like between the tight bookcase and all that, how the heck is it doing that? I don't know. Sounds Unless cool. it's just a really skilled operator and then, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's probably that too. Uh, okay. Very cool. Um, so we'll be looking at more about that in about a week or two. So I'm going to move on to Vectari. Um, if you remember, we talked about it a little bit yesterday. So I decided to spend a little time with uh, yesterday, um, last week. But I forgot my password and couldn't even get into it. So this week I made sure I could get into it. And I started playing with something. Now, I did this actually in Mesh Mixer and uh, another app that I have. And this is a face that I created that, I don't know, some of you might recognize him. But it's part of a uh, little app that I'm coming out with, hopefully in the next two weeks, called Pawn Donald. So... That should give you kind of an idea of what the app will be about. But uh, if you notice, I thought I had just brought it up, but uh, nothing seems to be functioning. Hmm. So that was one of the things that I noticed right away. And again, it might be because we're utilizing all our bandwidth to do the show, is that the performance on this, yeah, it's still spinning up there. The performance on this, I felt was, yeah, it just crashed too. So... <clears throat> Um, sometimes you so, gotta wait like you know if it's using up a lot of resources i don't know how many uh i don't know how much how many uh vectors are in your like or how many polygons are in that mesh but you know i mean if it's a huge file it's got to load it you know that's a good point chris and uh but still when i was working with it last night it wasn't um, that difficult hmm. uh, so let's let me go back i Got the camera on you right now, so I will, and see if we can bring it back again. <laughs> well, it's just not my day. Maybe we can hit it at the end of the show. All right. Oh, don't know what happened there. I, I well, Vectory, we'll I had a chance to kind of play around with it too, um, and they have some designs built in, some meshes that you can, and what's cool about Vectory is it's, it's really great um, for kind of direct modeling applications. So rather than, you know, it's a great alternative, uh, free alternative to something like, you know, what I use a professional suite of, you know, that's fairly expensive, like space claim, you know, ANSYS space claim, which is a really great tool, but it's expensive. And so Vectory kind of um, offers a lot of the same tools for free, at least for now. And, uh, I think they were saying for free in the future too, were they not? I can't remember what they're. Yeah, I, they I don't know what it is. Um, but it has I, some really good uh, mesh modeling yeah. or uh, direct modeling features. So you can take in like an STL or something that's tri triangles and you can select a face and you can pull it out and kind of manipulate it. And it's got some kind of cool, uh, cool features in it. Yeah. Well, I didn't come away with the same impression, Chris. So I guess we're kind of like Siskel and Ebert here. Um, <laughs> I felt that the application, uh, well, we can go ahead and use the get started here. Um, as you, as I just showed you, um, it, um, yeah, so there's a little, um, it has a few introductory uh, videos that you can go through. Uh, it uh, uses, in my opinion, kind of a, a look and feel of Tinkercad. Or, you know, we've talked about that in the last couple of shows. But as you said, it's for mesh modeling versus solid modeling. Or And uh, so you can import, and that's probably why it crashed. I imported my Trump face, and it may have had too many polygons, at least on my system here. My system upstairs, it worked pretty well. But then that uh, makes me wonder of uh, what kind of machine you need in order to provide the performances. Now, Chris, you mentioned that you felt that it was a complete mesh model, and, I, and that's where I, I would like to a little bit disagree. I've used uh, some mesh modeling applications for, gosh, several decades now, and one that I really like 
is Silo, which is like less than $100, um, which is a great mesh modeling tool. Now, again, it's not on the web, so that's a, another advantage of this. It's cloud-based, but um, I find it very responsive. It's both for the Mac and the PC. And then another one that we've talked about on several times, which I really love because of its organic tools, is Mesh Mixer. And uh, Mesh Mixer uh, is from Autodesk, and it's another free product. But again, it's for your desktop. So, you know, my question is, will you be able to, from a cloud perspective, be able to support this? And as you can see in this little video here, the, the compilation of tools are, are fairly complete, but they're, uh, they don't really provide any organic functionality. Um, essentially, you can... And if you can see the tool that you select in there, you can select either a an actual vertice or a line or a face as he's going through there. And you can select those and you can pull, subtract, rotate. Um, but this is something that's been available in applications for some time. As you can see there, he should be manipulating something here shortly. Um, but I found that as far as doing things like mesh mixer where you can actually deform your mesh model like it's a piece of clay uh, i felt that it was limited in that perspective um, so that that was my carry away and again because i brought in my little trump face um, it, having organic objects be able to push and pull uh, if it were like clay i think is an important tool uh, but if you have some basic models, as you mentioned to uh, Chris, then I think this, this could be, as you said, if it's free, no reason to sign up for it. And it, is, it does work in uh, Google Chrome. I'm assuming it works in other applications like Safari. So, you know, no reason not to sign up. So what was the yeah, big here. feature that you liked? Well, I, like I said, the only models I really played with were the ones that they had up on there, and I just checked it out briefly. Um, I didn't spend hours in it by any means. But uh, I just like the fact that, like, you could select uh, kind of like a, you know, they had they had an area that, like, they had a flamingo, and you could select, like, kind of a whole side of the flamingo pretty easily and pull it out and kind of do things you know, that some of the other tools might, you know, it, it's very, it, it, it's not, it doesn't do anything revolutionary. At least I didn't see anything that it does revolutionary. What it does do that is revolutionary is run in the browser, like you were saying. So you could have a Raspberry Pi, and that's what I think is so powerful about things like Onshape and this. This is where it's all going to go is, you know, you have microcomputing, and as long as you have a solid internet connection, you can have a microcomputer, whether it's a Pi or even just a laptop, or you can be working in a coffee shop and you can be doing really powerful operations. Um, you know, and I think even video editing is eventually going to get there, you know, because video ed editing, again, it's another process processor and GPU intensive task uh, that requires, you know, almost like a data lake. Uh, you almost need this, this uh, massive uh, amount of, uh, data that you're crunching and some t on doing it on a laptop is just really not that practical anymore now that we have everything's high def or ultra high def or 3D and now VR that now the processor it's so processor and GPU intensive that it's almost going to be driven out of necessity that we go and do these things in the cloud. So, or you're just, or it's just going to be relegated to people that have workstations that are thousands and thousands of dollars and constantly kind of like buying and improving their machines. But I think it's more practical to have to do, to build these apps. I think the future, th this is my opinion is the future of apps are definitely done in the cloud, especially because you might only be doing this task for an hour or two or let's say four hours out of your day and somebody and so the the uh, aggregated amount you know just like when you look at Amazon cloud the the whole idea behind the cloud is there's this this pretty uh, steady amount of aggregate traffic you know throughout the world of internet traffic so that's why the cloud makes sense is because you know there's whether, it doesn't matter what website you're on, 
they can, you know, if you're on a website, you know, part of the part of the world is on a website this much, and the and it can it can adjust. The cloud can adjust to um, the needs of the users on the fly, whereas you know your machine cannot. Just one single machine cannot do that. Well, as you know, I'm a Fusion 360, and I like the the combination. Um, if you do have a more powerful machine, the thing that I'm noticing right now is that in order to do what you're saying, you need to at least have a large enough pipe to be able to stream the information back. So you were talking about video editing, you know, editing, uh, unless you work with proxies, which I think is the only way that you'd be able to do this um, via the internet, is if you're working with 4K material, uh, yes, it makes sense to render it at the end uh, using cloud services because it's faster. And I, in my experience in the past uh, using 3D rendering, I had a render farm, which I use multiple machines. So um, having cloud function I, which is also built into Fusion. But one of the things that I've noticed with um, like these type of applications here is the limited functionality because you know even though you can visually see this uh, if you made this a very complex object you still have to be able to rotate it on your machine and if you send it out to the cloud and then it makes the rotation then it's got to feed back the results um, again it's all dependent upon your connection and if your connection is limited uh, that could be an issue right so my thing is is pain more so what I what I envision is is the obviously look at where we are leaps and bounds i mean my cable internet is it's even business class internet for me we pay i think i pay 80 bucks a month something around that with phone and you know i've got a 60 plus meg connection uh you know so it's a cable internet connection and i mean just a few years ago in our town it was not even anywhere near that. So, I mean, we're, it's, it's progressing. I know AT&T is running fiber, um, and they're really pushing the fiber out to people. I know Verizon's doing the same thing. And obviously we live in an interesting kind of frontier of internet it being in California. Um, it's not South Korea. So I've, so I've been told <laughs> South Korea I've heard is pretty, uh, pretty, uh, crazy as far as their yeah. internet. Yeah. Um, yes, I agree with you. Um, but also keep in mind that the the back end also have to be pretty beefy in order for these. You know, when you ask it to do a transform, that transfer has to be done immediately and then spit back. So there's a lot of areas that still have to beefed up. I don't know if we're there yet with this application. Again, I didn't play with it a lot, but I did bring some of my own uh, meshes in, and as you saw earlier, <laughs> it did have a hard time with that, and it wasn't. Overlay, I think it may have been like 30, 30K as far as faces um, or vertices. <laughs> and uh, so it wasn't significantly large. Well, I can so, tell you. I noticed that, I couldn't yeah. import one that was even larger. So there are some limitations to it. But as a learning tool, yeah, I think it might be a great little tool. I can tell you uh, hands down, like Onshape already, which is a like I think they're less than two years old, right, Onshape? it can handle assemblies that SOLIDWORKS cannot, you know, and that's because it's running, you know, it's in the background, it's on some server class, you know, server class hardware. I'm sure that from a software engineering perspective that they've designed it from the ground up to be, you know, multi-thread, uh, multi-processor, whereas SOLIDWORKS is single processor, it's multi-thread, but it's, it's single processor and, you know, single GPU. Uh, whereas Onshape is all done, it's all, it, everything was designed from the ground up to be on server class hardware. The data sets obviously can be much, much larger. And it runs these, I mean, they have videos and webinars you can watch that are just insane amounts of parts that there's no way you could even run those in SOLIDWORKS without killing it, without killing your machine and having crashes all the time. So the, the possibilities are, I think there, there's, uh, there's definitely it. It definitely has uh, broken through a technological milestone of going to these apps, and I think that the future for me, I see, you know, and, and the fact that it's like we were saying aggregated, is you're only working on you only pay for your usage.
average, let's say. So you're maybe only doing four hours a day. Another guy's only doing four hours a day. You're not paying for a machine to run 24 hours a day like you are in your office. You're only paying for that four hours. So they might they might end up going to some model where they're they're basing it kind of like what Amazon does with the S3, you know, or the instances, whatever cloud computing you pay you pay per hour essentially or per uh it's per minute i think you pay um depending on your usage so like whatever if you need to move up to a bigger a bigger server it'll scale up you know because it's basically a virtual server and it's you're using this much a micro instance and it's you know 10 cents per hour and you jump up to a 50 cents per hour if you need more and so I, I I don't know we might we might see uh, applications kind of go this way where instead of even paying by the month you're paying by the minute or something I don't know we'll see we will see other than when you lose your connection and your whole model is gone well for like on shape if you lose your connection or your computer yeah uh, uh, your Chrome crashes. It didn't lose anything because it's all done on the fly and on shape. So it's kind of it's kind of cool that way too. And you're you feel a little bit more secure in your data because it's not like your hard drive was backing up. It's all done on some server that's all RAID redundant and probably way more. Uh, I mean, the people engineering it are way more technically literate than we are in this stuff. You know, they know how to build servers better than anyone in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's move on to the first news item then. Awesome. So you have uh, 3D printing is revolutionizing shop motion animation. Yeah, you want to bring that YouTube video up. This is an interesting. Uh, mm, I didn't. I don't have a YouTube. Okay, video no, for that. no, no problem. Um, I can uh, bring this up here. This is from Dig, which <laughs> I actually haven't seen Dig in a long time. Um, but they did a, a great little video on um, Leica, not the camera Leica, but another uh, a stop ma animation design studio up in Portland, Oregon, and uh, how 3D printing is revol revolutionizing stop motion animation. And uh, anybody that's interested in stop motion animation should definitely go check this video out. It'll Here. be in the show notes. Stop Stop it for a moment. Oh, yeah. Wow. So you, you saw Gumby there, right? Yeah. Do you know where that uh, originated? Yeah. The, uh, he, the, guy, the, the creator was Moro Bay local. I'm um, actually Los Osos which is about 20 minutes from me. So, yep. I actually talked to a, we went to have tea with a gentleman who uh, immigrated from England. Uh, he's been here for like 30 years, but kind of talked about uh, the guy behind Gumby, and I don't remember his name right now. So we have so our own local star. Leica has been responsible for a lot of um, Academy Award winning uh, kind of stop motion animations. And so what it what the video kind of goes through is like here here's um, Nightmare Before uh, Christmas, which I was lucky enough to go to the premiere of uh, back in the day. This is a Tim Burton movie, real famous movie. And they're, they what was revolutionary about uh, Nightmare Before Christmas was this uh, they made a bunch of different heads for the same character so that they could improve the the character, the, or the the facial expressions, and they've just improved, improved, improved upon this. But now that they want to push the envelope, they literally need like hundreds of these heads, and to to hand sculpt those all would be just not that feasible. I mean, it it would just take too long and cost way too much money. Even though, uh, the so 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 they're doing it in different ways now and Leica is utilizing 3D printing and it's totally revolutionizing the way they're doing it. I think they had one film that used like 5200 different uh little faces. Here's Paranorman. Um this one they used a a, a printer a full color printer to kind of do the base so they were able to get even more rich color. Um they talk about it in the video. And uh, towards the end here, they have a new video coming, a new a new movie coming out, this one here. And 
it looks pretty awesome and it looks computer animated but it's and it is computer animated. This is the weirdest part is they have to animate all this on the computer to print it, right? To get to even make the thing to, to you know, they have to not animate it, but they have to model it on the computer. And it looks modeled. And then they obviously post process it in the computer. So it, it makes me wonder why I guess they just want to, uh, uh, they want to put themselves through another level of challenge. These people are just super creative. Um, but this this new movie that's coming out, uh, I'm going to have to find the name of the movie here. Kubo and the Two Strings is the new movie, new movie coming out. So here's a bunch of different faces they're showing. <laughs> Blowing bubbles and um, cool stuff. So Kubo and the Two Strings. Go watch this uh this video though it's it's pretty informative and kind of shows uh, a lot of the behind the scenes stuff and i mean just an amazing amount of uh of work goes into these movies i i i remember watching the behind the scenes of uh one of my favorite movies is team america world police by the creators of south park really yeah. funny movie super super uh uh just kind of inappropriate yeah, I, obviously I don't, I don't think it's in the same class as uh as this kubo and the two strings yeah, yeah no it's not but they said the trey parker and matt stone are like okay this is like they thought it was a great idea to do uh to to make the, a stop motion film and then uh halfway through the movie they're like oh this is the last time we'll ever do this because it was just a, a way too much work compared to what they're used to with the animating on the computer and after effects you know <laughs> So pretty well, cool a little, stuff. Yeah, a little side note, Chris. Uh, we've had a couple of guests on over the uh, past two years uh, that have done something like this, obviously on a smaller scale, but it was also a smaller team of maybe like one. Uh, we had the gentleman from France who actually yep. used a form one printer to print out all of his components. We'll have to go back and check on that because he just had a trailer. I'd like to see if he actually released that uh, little stop motion. Remember, it was the girl through the woods. I think it was like a Red Riding Hood, if I remember correctly. What a talented, I mean, yeah. just a, a multi-talented because you have to be able to not only model these organic shapes, but it also requires you to implement mechanics obviously yep. not just in the walking and everything but the mechanics to put everything together and kind of make the scene kind of come together so it really takes a a, a really eclectic amount of talent it's just insane the amount of work that goes into these sure things. is okay well let's move on to the next item um and this you know if you're a person who has to uh you know, give a presentation. Um, let's say you're a student in a classroom and they want to know more about 3D printing. Um, I found this through, let's see which site it was. Um, let's see, I think TechCrunch. Yeah, actually, yeah, but it's uh, three TechCrunch is where I originally saw the article. Uh, so I went out to this location, which is uh, 3D Hubs, and they go through all the basics and they have really good succinct explanations. What I thought was kind of cool is this little chart here uh, that kind of went through the whole process. So if you wanted to, to look at uh, vat polymerization, uh, which we know is the form one through SLA and did DLP, which if you remember, I had the, well, we've had a couple, uh, there are a couple of DLP printers out there. Who do we know notably? somebody local what's his name brad hill yeah i think that's it and his little rp um, is a dlp type printer and then this continuous digital light processing which is used by the carbon 3d and the envision tech uh, if you remember we've talked about that several times and uh, if you're interested in getting something through the carbon 3d uh, and can't afford one because they are fairly expensive sculptress i think is uh, or Sculptio, I think is the name of them. Uh, they're a company out of France who does fabrication like Shapeways. They have a few of these. Um, and I also believe uh, Carbon 3D is also being used by Shapeways now in the Netherlands. So if you're looking at any of these items, Chris, as you know, um, does stereolithography. He has a Form 2, lucky guy. 
Um, and uh, we also both have the little RPs. And uh, what was the other? I've already forgotten their name. Uh, kind of started it all before Form 1. They had the, I actually had one and then sold it, but uh, I can't think of the name. It was also a DLP projector base. If it comes B9, in there, The B9 Creator, it's right under there, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I guess if I look at it, there it is. The B9 Creator. Uh, hey, we should complain and say, where's the little RP? Oh, well. <laughs> but, uh, so if we move on, FDM, fused deposition, I mean, obviously there are a lot of companies. Uh, we have talked about several of those and talks the type of materials that can be used uh, and then identifies what FDM stands for. And then we move on to material jetting. Um, we have the cured with UV lighting, cured with heat and milled, and obviously the companies behind those. And then we have the binder jetting process, which is gypsum send or metal and the companies behind that. And then obviously HP, this powdered bed fusion, which is MGF, multi-jet fusion, SLS, selective lasering, and so forth. So it's a nice little overview. So if you wanted to go through and talk about each of these, I thought that was a nice little chart. Again, uh, 3D Hubs has information on all these. You can just scroll through it. It has little videos. So if you want to know more, you know, obviously we talk a lot about, uh, excuse me, about it a lot, but these are very succinct little videos uh, with great little explanations on how all the processes work. So if you're interested in that, I would look into it. Chris, next item. All right. Well, slow. It's a 3D printed camera. This was. Uh, this has actually been online. Or I've seen one before, but this is the, a new one. Um, I thought you were talking screen. about San Luis Obispo. I know. I thought I was too, but uh, uh, no, it's called SLO, a 3D printed camera. I think it's, I don't know if it has to do with squinting squinting looking doing um but this camera is a fully 3d printed uh 35 millimeter single reflex camera and he works on a form 2 he says and it's all 0.25 millimeter clearances and here it is it has an aperture, a working aperture. It has a, a, you know, door. It's got adjustment knobs. It's got zoom, and then, uh, it 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 has a lens even that you can print. Uh, he mm -hmm. obviously recommends the form two for um, in printing clear resin, um, and then smoothing it down with 400 grit or tw and, and then up to a 12,000 grit sandpaper. Yeah, we covered uh, probably gosh, close to two years ago, Foreign Labs had a lens. nice tutorial if you wanted to create a lens using That's theirs. right. So he made his own <laughs> according to theoretical focal length uh, mm -hmm. and all this. I mean, the guy, uh, the guy did, did his homework on building this thing. And uh, it's basically a clone, it looks like, of this Olympus he's got here. And he's got a whole uh, shutter think, system, and I think clone is pushing it. But okay, okay, <laughs> yeah, it definitely is his own. Uh, so here's some photos that he took on the thing. Uh, let me let me go through here. Thirty-five millimeter photos taken on a fully three D printed camera. Every piece printed on the camera or printed. Every piece of the camera printed, 3D printed on a Form 2. And he's t obviously other than the film. <laughs> but, hey, it's taking photos. You can capture real photos. And I know you can take photos on a, uh, you know, even with a pinhole camera in film. But this is cool because it actually looks and feels and adjusts like a real camera and has all the features of the camera. The photos are obviously still kind of blurry because it's taking it through a clear lens that was 3d printed on a out of resin that was hand sand sanded down but um and he's got the 3d files up on pin shape and uh which you can follow the link and we will include it in uh he has it for free on pin shape um cool it's called the slo printed lens camera and we'll include so it in the show notes obviously 
Interesting. SLO instead of SLR. What does the O stand for? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why he calls it the SLO. Hmm. Well, maybe next next episode you can tell us what that means. Okay. All right, let's let's move on to. Um, Gosh, what section are we in? Well, I guess 3D technology. Um, actually, it's in 3D design, and I thought this was kind of interesting. Let me jump to my quick. Uh, you're familiar with Wacom or Wacom, depending That's on... what I got on my yeah. desk. <laughs> and I have one, too, and I think I actually have the wireless version of the, uh, I guess it's Intuos. Mm -hmm. And this particular version here is supposedly 3D. So I tried to look at it. Well, what makes this 3D? It is basically <laughs> a Wacom Intuos, but it includes this new application from a company that uh, I think you just purchased uh, something from. It's called, dun, 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 let's see if it says the ZBrush Core from Pixelogic. Now, the, the interesting thing is, I'm going to have to get this to even figure out how to use ZBrush. Damn, well, ZBrush is like just, okay. it's like the one I can't, I can't uh, seem to figure out. So maybe this will make it easier. Well, let's talk about it a little bit. First of all, they kind of jumped the gun on this because when I saw this, uh, Intuos, not Intuos, uh, Pixelogic hadn't even announced <laughs> the ZBrush core. So um, actually, I'll go to a, a link here in a moment. So I thought that was kind of amusing that, uh, Wacom or Wacom broke the news on this first. So I thought, oh, that's kind of neat. But the, basically, it is a standard Wacom tablet with this, I guess, meaning core, a lighter version of the uh, ZBrush. So some people have already noted that part of the, the number of options uh, seem to be reduced, which I think is a good thing. Uh, I also have ZBrush, and like you, I found it counterintuitive in a whole lot of features. And uh, as you said, it takes a, a lot to, to actually try and get things done on it. I know there are people out there, we've had a few when we're doing our meetups every month, who come out and actually show us using this. So uh, I know there are quite a few people. There's a lot of cool stuff done with it. I'm a big fan of Pixelogic. Um, so this is very interesting. The pricing, though, is, a, well, Wacom pad, um, tablets are a little bit pricey to begin with. I think is a $300. Will not be available till October. However, uh, Pixelogic will actually get an opportunity before that's released to, at the end of the month, actually maybe even, yeah, September 30th, they will be making the announcement for ZBrush Core. Uh, so there you go. There's kind of the features of it. Some people have kind of thought, well, maybe this will replace, let's make sure I get the right name. Was it Sculptress? Yeah. Um, Sculptress, which is, if you remember, the light version that was free from Pixelogic, so this may replace it. Um, they're thinking uh, like the Moto Light and I think, what is it, Maya Lights, that this will join that. There might be a smaller fee along with it. I don't know. Nothing else has been announced on it, so we'll be looking at this in the future. Um, yeah, kind of cool. And so if you're interested in using a Wacom tablet, and they are very beneficial. I use one with uh, 3D Coat, and uh, I find it very useful for not only applying textures, um, but also uh, manipulating the mesh deformation by using a pad. Uh, it really works well. So I highly recommend that if you plan to do any organic um, modeling or texturing. Uh, oh, and you can't, I mean, I can't imagine uh, uh, using, you know, really getting into the nitty gritty of Photoshop without having some basic uh, tablet functionality. You really have to have a tablet if you're going to do any kind of art, like really and get serious about it. And they're not expensive anymore. I mean, I, I think they start at 99 bucks or even less. If you don't want a uh, Wacom ta tablet, you can go on Amazon. You can buy a cheap uh Oh, thirty dollars. Yeah, you can buy one. But, for you, yeah. but I found you get what you pay for. And sure. There are lower cost Wacom tablets for kids and people. But you get that pressure them. sensitivity, which you really need if you're gonna like do brush anything with brushes. Uh, the cool thing about some of these, like they call it the 4D brushes, and if you have a canvas painter, like Corel, uh, what do they call it? Corel Painter, really yep. cool app, and it'll actually track. 
the uh, direction of the uh, the Wacom I have will actually track how the brush, how like what direction. So like if you're doing brush strokes, it knows the like the the actual uh, direction of the pen in relation to the tablet. So you can actually like do full brush strokes and it'll kind of mimic brush strokes. And there's some, you can go to uh, um, uh, Corel's uh, painter website and look at some of the art that some of these artists create with the um, Corel painter. It's, I mean, it, it mimics anything on a real canvas for sure, if not beyond, because you have the ability to do mixed media in a way that you can't do on a real canvas. So here are some of the specifications for the tablet. Um, one of the cool features, but it looks like it's sold separately, and I do have it on my version, is that uh, you can use a dongle system and set it up so that it works wirelessly, which I think is a cool hmm. feature. So you can put it on your lap. Um, so mine does that. The other thing that's kind of neat, the ergonomics, and you did mention it, um, it also can determine the angle of your brush. So you can, you know, if you've done any pencil sketching or rendering, which I've done in the past, you know, the positioning of your pencil determines possibly the thickness or your shading functionality. That can also be uh, replicated uh, with a Wacom Paddle or a Wacom, however you want to pronounce it. I'm going to pronounce a Wacom um, from now on. But uh, here they show somebody looking at a model, but obviously uh, and with this new application. So two Cool things, if you don't have a tablet, you might want to hold off, wait for this one. I think it's about $300, uh, but we'll include the new uh, ZBrush Core uh, when it's released. So you might want to hold off on that. Could be a very cool feature. Uh, we'll talk a little, a little bit more next month when it actually comes out, because I think cool. I might get one. Okay, awesome. so move on to the next item, Chris. What do you have? Okay, uh, this is uh, in the Scanner Darkly section, if you want to bring it up. Uh, you mean the Scanner Darkly? Oh, yeah, and this is Wrap3D, which is a Russian company. I think it's Russian because it's Russian3dscanner.com. And this is Wrap3. And it's a, a new 3D scanning processing app. They've had, this is the third iteration, obviously. And uh, you can pull my screen up here and show um, some of the processing that it's capable of doing. Um, and it's it's just it caught my eye. It's really interesting. Um, so they just released Wrap Three. They've had a uh, another component called Wrap X, but this is like a um, for 3D scan processing. And it'll clean up meshes and help you kind of obviously in animation workflows and um, keying workflows, like if you need to key 3D geometry. So here they are, they're keying this, um, this head and it like speeds it all up. Um, so it's taking this like 3D scan data and then you can see what it, um, some of the features. This video is just actually pretty, pretty nice video, kind of just showing some of the tools that it has built in, um, selecting uh, parts of the mesh and um, selecting inside sections. Like if you were going to make a 3D scan talk, um, so this this helps kind of map the geometry to. Uh, what do they call that? Normal, uh, normal polygons, right? So that's like a normal mesh that you would use for animation. And usually going from, so there it is, making a texture map, and I by no means am an expert at any of this stuff, but uh, it looks like a pretty powerful tool. I'm getting it. I need that. <laughs> So, um, so yes, one of the things that's uh, important, it's called morphing, and essentially you go from one uh, set of, what do you want to call it, uh, mesh uh, vertex locations to another set of mesh vertex locations, and they have to be identical, but this is how some applications uh, allow you to do uh, animation without actually having um, points of articulation, uh, you know, joint, skeleton. 
and by just reshaping the vertices based upon the expressions or phonemes. And companies like um, Poser and Daz3D use this technique as, as well as others. Um, more complex processes actually build a full skeleton structure and an even muscular structure in order to replicate uh, speech from a human that's lifelike. Um, but uh, yeah, this is very cool. All right. Yeah, and I'm, they have a 15-day so trial, in a, or you can buy it for three, 317, $370. $370? It's not too yeah. bad. And they'll do, uh, and then they obviously will do uh, batch processing is another thing that it kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> kind of talks about is batch processing is going through using, taking your scan data and kind of getting it into a format. I mean, scan data, you know, is just super uh, hard to work with just the raw scan data. You really have to get it into a normal poly mesh for you to, that's like at least usable um, because in a format like this, it's, it's just really not that usable. So you have to use software like this that will process it down and normalize it, especially if you're going to put it in a video game or something like that. Yeah, th exactly. Uh, there's obviously a, a lot of things that need to be done. One, uh, obviously, these are high vertus meshes. Extreme, we're talking millions, and to use them in a gaming environment, you have to uh, retessellate it, and uh, that could be or reduce the number of polygons. And there are certain algorithms work better than others, and then you sometimes you have to go back and do smoothing on it because the reduction doesn't always look very good. And um, the other, uh, I just wanted to mention, there is another company out there, Autodesk, that, what's the program called? Recapture. Uh, it used to be uh, Memento, if I remember correctly, that has uh, a tool set as well for scanning. So this seems to be a, an area that we're starting to see much better tools for this kind of stuff. So very cool. All right, let's move on to the next thing. And I'm going to actually jump to uh, 3D in medicine, we kind of skipped that over in order to just bounce back and forth. And my item today is uh, something called ultrasound holography. And, you know, as you know, I talk a lot about 3D uh, medicine in scanning using uh, both CT. Um, we've had, uh, what's his name, Dr. Cleos from uh, Florida. Not, yeah. Um, who's come on and talked about how CT scans work, how MRIs work, and ultrasound. Now, the cool thing about ultrasound is, one, uh, at least short term, there doesn't seem to be any uh, nefarious issues uh, with the, the penetration of ultrasound sonic waves, at least currently. And so it is not only cheaper, um, but it is also safer. At least they identify that it's safer. But the problem is, uh, even though they have some tools, and I've kind of talked about how to take ultrasounds and create a 3D structure. Remember the little baby trinket that I created, or the fetus trinket? Um, so, and actually, I get a few people asking me, how did I do that? And uh, so I provide a little uh, link, if you're interested in that, uh, that has both a video of me using certain tools, as well as a little guide. But the cool thing about ultrasound holography is like standard holographies, and we've talked about this and how Microsoft is kind of, uh, what do you want to call it? Change the name of holography, but normal holography uh, or laser holography is based upon interference patterns where you take uh, two beams, split them, and then uh, send one at the object and then you send another one at the actual plate or the point that these two um, come together in order to create an interference pattern. And what it does is it creates a phase difference between the two, and that's what's actually captured. So if you look at a standard um, hologram, you don't really see anything. It's just a bunch of little dots and weird little um, shapes. But if you sign... Uh, shine the same coherent light or at least a monochromic light source that matches the wavelength that you originally created the laser with, it pops out and creates a hologram. And if you've ever experienced a good hologram, it looks like the object is there. I mean, it really looks like it's tangible. And 
So what do we have with ultrasound? Well, we use a similar technology, except we use two ultrasonic waves. Now, what they say when they talk about this is this particular design makes it very usable um, for mammograms, or actually not even mammograms because those are x-ray based, but using um, ultrasound in breast tissue, which has always been very difficult because the density of it and the way that normal ultrasounds work, it creates noise and interference and you have to wade that through in order to determine if there are cancers or, or tumors. And But what this does is it literally goes all the way through it and by creating the interference pattern, it allows it to create this three-dimensional hologram based upon ultrasound and allows them to have a much clearer image of the material used. Now, obviously, they talk about its use in breast ultrasonography, uh, which is extremely important. And a lot of people have been concerned about using uh, mammograms, which is x-rays, year after year. And they think that may actually create problems with uh, uh, inducing cancer in itself so they there's a lot of controversy over this but if we can create a tool uh, that works or at least provides imaging as clear that's much safer and also provide a three-dimensional meaning we could actually rotate it and look at the inner core uh, of the breast or other materials i could see this being used uh, in genital areas and men uh, and things like that which uh, ultrasound as well is used as well also maybe even to provide better imaging in the internal uh, structure of the stomach again because it's safe so i look forward to this um, if you want more details on what hologram ultrasounds are i'll have both of these in it. it's called genesis ultrasound uh, which was done up in university of washington that talks about their process and here you go here's a little image of how that goes about doing it uh, but again just like laser, it creates an interference pattern based upon ultrasounds. And again, when we talk about ultrasound, we're not talking audible. We're talking in the gigahertz range, except it's, you know, actual auditory vibrations. But it's just a much higher frequency range if you were not aware of that. And supposedly it's safe. Um, again, you know, I'm always hesitant to say things that are extremely safe until we have long-term efficacy and uh, we don't actually, you know, ultrasounds haven't been around that long yet, but we'll see. But right now it is the safest form and the more that we can provide detailed imagery of that, um, the better. And this seems to be the tool that uh, seems to be doing that. So new term, forget about what Microsoft calls their HoloLens in their process. Uh, that's just marketing junk. True holograms are based upon interference patterns, either from a coherent source, either lasers or in this case, ultrasounds. All right, Chris, next item from you. All right, VR corner in a round room, interactive 3D. We're going to talk about NASA. This is, comes to us via uploadvr.com. This was uh, earlier this week. NASA is using Manus VR gloves to train astronauts in mixed reality. We've talked about Manus, uh, the, the gloves before. They can actually kind of track your hands in the VR, kind of for mixed reality. And apparently, um, NASA is using these gloves to train for uh, spacewalks and uh, repairs. <laughs> they even have like duct tape and uh, you can you check out a video. You, you can check out this. Oh, sorry. I uh, meant to bring that up. Uh, let's bring that up here. And here they are. This is, uh, they're living in a holodeck. This is Manus VR, M-A-N-U-S, and showing the gloves. So and when I was at JDC in March, I actually had an opportunity to talk with them and uh, invite them on the show. So maybe I should go back and make sure we can get them on the show. Um, I actually got to try it. It's kind of cool. Uh, what you see on the back of there is um, the the glove HTC. itself. Yeah, the glove itself only pr provides the joint um, positioning. It does not provide the actual positional tracking, and that's the purpose of the HTC Vive uh, uh, hand controller. There, they place it on the back of it. That's what provides the positional tracking, and then the actual glove provides, so it allows them to do what you see there. Uh, it's pretty crazy that we just live in a time like we do. 
<laughs> the fact that you can simulate living in zero G, um, there's a really, uh, there's a couple really great Oculus apps. Um, one of them is I'm trying to remember the name of it. It was one of the first apps I downloaded. It was, and it's like you're in space and it, mm -hmm. the, the space station is kind of blown apart. And if you're not careful, you'll, you will get motion sickness because it, I mean, it, it's very real. You almost have to be standing up, um, to really experience it. But look at that. I mean, he's interacting in basically mixed reality. It's, it's like real, it's like a real world. And then it's only a matter of time before there's interactive objects you can put in a room. Pretty so, cool. Yeah. Very cool stuff. Well, we'll try and get them on. Um, obviously, it's very interesting technology, and we'll see where they're at on it. I don't know if they launched a Kickstarter. I think they did. Um, but I have seen it. Pretty cool, and uh, we'll try and get them on. Okay, so let's move on to my item. You know, we've talked about uh, Adobe in the past and how they're supporting... 3D in Photoshop, and we've actually had an interview with one of their evangelists to talk about it. Um, but one of the things that, if you remember, uh, Chris, I've done a few, both stereo 360s as well as um, what I call composite 360s, where I put myself within the 360 environment. And I had to use several tools to do that. And I thought, God, wouldn't it be nice if Adobe actually does? Now, there are a few plugins out there, but it's nice to actually know that you can do this now in Premiere. Um, so there is not what they call support VR workflow. You know, it's a misnomer. I call 360 capture or stereo 360 passive VR because you don't actually move and you can only rotate your head. But you can do this now. And it has some tools to, uh, one, set up your monitor and uh, not only allow you to bring in uh, rectangular uh, video, and then it will process it properly so you can move around in it. It will also, if you're using either up, down, or side-to-side -side, uh, stereo 360, uh, it will allow you to look at it with anaglyph glasses. I did not notice, um, uh, it did not say that uh, you had the ability of actually hooking your Oculus Rift up and viewing it. I did not see a feature like that. It did, like I said, uh, allows you to use your anaglyph classes to see it in 3D, but I did not see something that identify, um, be able to actually view it within your, so maybe that'll be the next thing. But the fact is that I don't need additional tools to export, because currently what I've had to do is create my images in either Premiere or After Effects, export the um, mp4 into a tool in from google that attaches the proper metadata so that it's recognized by youtube as a 360. so it's you know, it's a multi-process the the other thing because i've tried to create some very high resolution uh, stereo 360s and the largest i've created they call it an 8k but it's about 5,000 by 5,000 upper and lower, uh, which gives you some really good results. Uh, you cannot do that in Premiere. Premiere is limited to 264, which is 38 by 60. And so I had to actually go outside of that. And I can't even remember the tool, but it's a command line tool that I used. Now, a lot of people work with it. If it comes to me later on, I'll bring it up. But uh, I've used that in the past in order to push the limits. And then I bring that into uh, the Google tool. So I have to see at what point or what type of resolution I can actually get out of Premiere. Uh, so we'll see. I'll play with that this weekend. I have some other projects that I'd like with. But the fact is that you can use Premiere now and uh, work with other compositing within it, uh, I think is a pretty cool feature. I thought I had read that After Effects also had some new tools, but I couldn't find them. Um, so I don't know if they will be available or not within After Effects, but the fact having the, the ability to work with 360s within Premiere without having additional plugins. Um, this was just updated in the last CC update. So if you are a subscriber to the whole package, you should now have this feature. So wow. pretty cool. Plan to try it this weekend and I'll report back uh, with an update next week. So Chris, on the next item. Okay. Well, the, we're actually splunking in the tech cave with you, or we're on to the print whisperer. 
let's go with the print whisper and uh, as mentioned my splunking I plan to uh, talk about how to essentially get gear VR capabilities without having a gear VR and uh, I think that's kind of neat. I kind of stumbled upon this, and I'll go through the step process in doing that. Awesome. Ahead, well, so, so the Print Whisperer, I know we've touched on bed adhesion issues in the past, but um, there's a lot has changed, obviously. In the last, I mean, it's always changing. So uh, your heated bed is nice and level, but you can't get your material to stick. And obviously, heated bed, super important in getting... Um, working with some of these new materials or almost any material besides PLA um, or the copolyesters like uh, Engine, which are real easy. But even those materials print a lot better if you have a heated bed. So that's step one. But uh, bed, he bed adhesion can be one of the most challenging things um, to get right, um, especially with materials like nylons and ABS and polycarb and those things. And there, I've seen online that people will claim that they can get away with like bare glass. They can print right on the glass, um, blue masking tape or capped on tape and all these different solutions and um, like capped on super expensive stuff. I mean, it's not cheap and there's way better solutions out there than these things um, because in production setting, like if you're going to make more than 10 parts, in a day or something. Um, bare glass or blue masking tape are kind of just rookie choices. That's how we all started, but um, there's a lot of choices out there, and I just wanted to share a few of my favorites. Uh, number one, obviously, the Lulzbot comes standard now with the PEI build, shape, build sheets, and they have them now in full-size sheets that are pretty huge. Uh, for 45 bucks, it seems like a lot, but it's a really nice uh, build surface, and these are 3M backed, and they're really easy to go on. They're nice and thick, um, so they're cleaned and heated uh, to the rec recommended temperatures. Your print will stick really well, they, re they say, and um, the first time in releases from the heated bed once cooled. Uh, so the Lulzbot Taz PEI sheet, probably my favorite. Um, once I upgraded to this PEI sheet from the PET uh, sheet that I, we used to use that's similar to Kapton, uh, there's no looking back. The PEI is just, it just sticks better to more materials. Uh, they have a recommended list of, a uh, recommended uh, materials list of, of when to use uh, uh, glue stick, you know, because sometimes you want to use a glue stick. Not necessarily for adhesion. Well, it, it kind of helps with adhesion, but it um, more importantly, I think, like with nylon, it actually makes it even possible, or even NinjaFlex, it makes it possible to actually remove the part once the thing is cooled down. So the glue stick kind of puts a little barrier that kind of will, some of it will peel off the bed and then you re reapply some glue. Um, so that's number one. Number two, obviously we've talked about it, but um, BuildTAC has come a long way too. So they uh, have uh, BuildTAC, which is a specialty uh, uh, bed material. You can buy it Matter Hackers, and you can buy I, it direct. I have it on all my 3D printers. And they have a Shout new one called that. FlexPlate, right, which is FlexPlate build system, which is uh, an easy way. You pull it off, and you can just pop that uh, so it's a it's a build tack sheet a flexible metal metal plate and a magnetic base so this is another one i haven't personally tried this out but i've heard really good things about it it makes getting some of your parts off a lot easier so i actually want to get one of these for my row stock that i want to get up and going and finally i want to talk about one that's on kickstarter that's really cheap and it's they they made their goal yeah they yeah, they made their goal. Um, I'm glad. They, uh, and uh, this is called Lock Build, and they're out of UK. And they have you got to watch this video. It's actually uh, looks like a pretty impressive. They've done some really impressive prints on this. Um, so like, here's a really. This part would be. I I don't think I could even do a part like that. Not a, not on PEI. I mean, this material could just be PEI for all I know. Um, I don't really know. They don't go into what it is exactly, but they show some pretty, uh, pretty
pretty awesome overhangs. It's apparently very forgiving in your uh, nozzle height too. So if your bed is not, you know, perfectly level, here's a uh, warp torture test. You can download that off Thingiverse. That's a common one. Um, usually pretty hard for like ABS parts uh, to print this part. And here it is printed, no problem. And I think these ones, they start at 12 bucks. And they're saying February delivery. So here they are printing uh, ABS, polycarb, AB, uh, more ABS, flexibles, Hollywood and PLA. And they say it works well with a heated bed and you can just trim it up. And here's all the different rewards. So that's a new one to look out for. My favorite being the PEI from Wolzbot. Mike's favorite, which is the build tack. I have one on my row stock um, now, but I want to upgrade to this one. I think this one's even better. They have the one that makes it the flexible one that makes it so you can pop parts right off. Because some of those parts, they can get... I told you a couple weeks ago, I cut my finger real bad trying to remove parts. Yeah. and that's kind no, This of a, sounds really cool. Yeah, so that's my tip of the day. Cool. Well, actually, maybe we... Um, that I think Build Tech reached out to me, so we should have them on the show um, as well because uh, I need to make another order. My Maker Gear, can't even remember the model number now, The uh, my go-to printer. I need to get a new Build Tech for. What I found is that, as you have, they really cling really well to these uh, surfaces, and <laughs> I found that if you don't set up your first layer properly, it could kind of like embed itself and make it very difficult to remove. And eventually, after a while, you have to replace these build tech beds. They're not that expensive, but just keep that in mind that, that you do have to replace them. All right, well, I want to get on to the Spelunker uh, in the Tech Cave. And um, I think I'll go through the, the web um, site first and talk about it. As mentioned, um, the theme of this particular show is how to use Gear VR stuff if you don't have a Gear VR. Uh, well, I guess that's kind of a link bait on my part. Um, you can't just <laughs> use a Gear VR. Um, Oculus does not make the app um, available. However, uh, as I have found out, all you need to do is use either the new, new Gear VR, which is what I have here, and plug it into it, which then asks you to load the Oculus. And once you have the Oculus tools, because the Gear VR is already embedded in your Galaxy phone, uh, you can then go through a process to enable what they call the developer mode. And so this kind of tells you how to set everything up. First, you need to create an Oculus account. So you go out to Oculus, you create yourself an account. Uh, if you've got a actual Gear, or not a Gear, um, an Oculus uh, Rift CV, or even the DK1 or DK2, you probably already have an account. Uh, and then you just log into it. And then uh, once the free account is set up, then you need to download the Oculus Android app. Again, remember that this is only possible if you plug your phone into a Gear VR. So however you go about doing that, I leave that to you. Also keep in mind that it needs to be a Samsung phone. So let's say you have a Galaxy, a new S7, the S7 Edge, or, yes, S7 Edge, or even the Note 7, like I do, but you don't want to spend $100 on the Gear VR. And I can understand that, because if you bought a Note 7 expecting to have the best performance out of the Gear VR, as I talked about in previous episodes, um, it was made for the original S7, which is only a 5.1-inch screen, if I remember. Yeah, something like that. So, and you go to a 5.7, you're actually cutting something off. So, I think... That was a disservice to those people who bought the larger S7 Edge or the Note 7 uh, to make it work best with the smaller phone. But if you do have a S7, have $100 of spare. Go ahead and do that. If not, just find somebody, maybe a pal who's got a Gear VR, plug your phone into it, log into it, download all the apps, and then you'll be set. So here they show turn your mobile device off and and this is how to use it uh yeah it's kind of pretty much describing and i guess you can this is an old um directions but the old version um 
you got six gains when you logged on. I don't think that was the case with the new Gear VR. I didn't receive any. Um, but let me go into another screen and I'll show you actually how to do this once you have it set up and going into what they call the developer mode. So essentially what you need to do, if you're not familiar with Android and you're just picking one for the first time, you click on the gear in the bottom. I you, I'm sorry, you drag down, bring up your, um, what do you want to call it, your top bar, hit the gear, which goes into your properties, find applications, tap on it, go to the application manager. Once it comes up, then you can go through. And the nice thing about the Note 7 and the Edge is that you have this little scroll bar on the side, which is very useful to get down because if you have a lot of apps, it can take a while just scrolling normally. And then you find uh, something called the Gear VR service. Again, this only comes up once you've installed things. And again, the first time you have to actually set up using an actual Gear VR device. After that, though, this can all be done. As you can see, I'm holding it in my hand. It's, not, it's no longer hooked up to the Gear VR. You then go into Storage. Then you go to Manage Storage. And there is now an option called Developer Mode and Add Icon to App List. I already have it turned on. What this does is it does a couple of things. It puts it in Developer Mode that I found that surprisingly allows you to pretty much load up any Oculus um, or Gear VR app without having the Gear VR hooked up to it. Plus, it also puts it into low persistence mode, um, which gives you somewhat of a flicker, but what that means is that you're now um, refreshing the screen at a higher rate. I, at, I think it's at 60 uh, frames per second or 60 hertz. So it has a slight flicker to it, but this is important because it also means that your screen refreshes faster. Uh, so you have less lag as you move around. The only caveat behind this, which is a benefit of the Gear VR, the Gear VR had an external IMU built into it, plus it had the touchpad. But I'll tell you, the touchpad isn't as important, as I'll, I'll mention in a moment, as the external IMU. The internal IMU is only capable of going up to, I think, 200 samples per second, where the Gear VR uses 1,000 samples per second. And also because it's external, it can be temperature controlled a little bit better than what's internally. I found that heat seems to affect these. Sorry about that. I always get when there's a video. In fact, I'll probably just drop out of this. Um, sometimes I get blurring sounds that, that the audience doesn't hear, but I hear it. It's distracting. So let me get back to this again. So once you have this up, you put it in developer mode, and then you're all set. So then you can just drop out of it by hitting the home button and then finding, and I think I have, there it is, the Oculus icon, which once you've installed everything, again, by using the Gear VR, you can now click on it, which I can do now. And uh, now I should be able to choose something and I'm going to go ahead and bring up through the ages which is what we talked about a little bit earlier with President Obama and National Geographic and this is about Yosemite. Notice you can see the uh, and uh, one thing I have noticed it affects the uh, and we saw this last time it affects the Chromecast uh, so I don't get constant refreshes but I should be able to refreshing now but there is another way that I can show it can you see it it's still dark Let it there we go. so it's loading right now but the cool thing is I now have full Gear VR visibility. My positional tracker, the IMU internally, seems to work. 152 years ago, 
President Abraham oh, yeah, now I can see it. protected the sacred grounds of Yosemite National Park. So actually, if I jump to Later, this screen. President Teddy Roosevelt traveled here. So if you have even a car, Google Cardboard, you can now watch all of your Gear VR stuff without actually having a Gear VR. Kind of cool. Audio still works. Notice I can move around. See? Yeah, that's that's cool, man. Yeah. So, in fact, uh, hey, what do I have here in my pocket? I don't know. Maybe I it's the VR. You play. So let me slap that on real quick. And this segment was brought to you by Neody VR Uplay. I don't know. I can't find this uh, thing anywhere on the Oculus store. So I don't know how you even get it on your Oculus. Ah, well, you weren't listening. <laughs> no, oh, I was. Mean, oh, I'm sorry. Oculus you mean? Store. Okay, you mean the national hmm. Ge Ge geographic thing? Um. So there you go. Very easy to set up. But again, remember that you need to find yourself a Gear VR once you've installed it. I've been using it for several days. It didn't seem to time out. Uh, it allowed me to go into it. It's a pretty cool because one of the features that the Gear VR has, which can, especially for demoing, and let me see if I can shut this off and turn it back on, and then actually, yep, there we go. Okay. Give me a moment. Okay. Hmm. Oh, well, I was hoping that the refresh screen would come up, but. Once you mess with it, it doesn't work properly. Oh, well, so that's a problem. Um, obviously, I can't Chromecast with it, but uh, it does function, as you could see I, when I had the phone up there. So if you're looking at uh, providing, um, obviously, you need a Samsung phone to do that, but if you don't want to buy it, or more importantly, if you have a VR system right now or mobile VR system shell or whatever, like uh, this one here, if you bought one of these, which I... I recommend it's about $35, the Bobo VR. You have one of these already. Um, like I said, find yourself a Gear VR, install the apps, and then you'll be able to put it in developer mode and use your Bobo VR. Um, so it's kind of a cool feature. Or if you're a developer, it keeps it on all the time. So you're able to uh, use it for development without having to put on the headset. Uh, so it's a lot quicker in functioning. So I thought that was kind of cool. And uh, I think I have one more item to talk about, which, because I can't actually use the Chromecast for it, but I guess I can throw it up there so you can see it um, with the large screen. The, uh, let's see if I can bring it up. So actually, you will be able to see it. So this is the uh, Sun Temple demo that I've been working on and I've created a version. This is the Google VR version. So uh, if you're not aware of it, there you go. This is the using ES 3.1, OpenGL ES 3.1, as well as um, uh, anti-aliasing, which is difficult to do in the Gear VR and uh, only works with OpenGL ES 2. Um, which doesn't provide some of the shader functionality that you have in ES 3.1. And uh, so I feel personally uh, the Gear VR had much more, even though both of them have high latency and poor frame redraws, uh, I found the Gear VR, or no, sorry, the Gear VR, the Google VR version um, seemed to have less of it. When I use the Gear VR, and obviously I can't show you it because when I'm in Gear VR, the Chromecast doesn't work as pro as well. And again, it's more jerky now because I am using the Chromecast. Um, what I did notice is that the frame redraws, even though they lagged, uh, seem more fluid in the Google VR system. 
Now, again, this is on a Samsung Note 7 that has not been optimized with Android uh, 7.1, which is supposed to have the new Daydream, which just was announced when they had their announcement on October 4th. Uh, Google will have something to talk about as far as Daydream. Some people think it might be a headset. Um, I don't think that'll be the case. I think they'll probably talk about some of the manufacturers and phones that'll be Daydream ready. Um, but the point is, right now, if you're using the Unreal Engine, you can export out as Google VR or Google Cardboard uh, to multiple devices, and it has now become available for iOS. So I look forward to exporting the Sun Temple to the iPhone 6S Plus and the iPhone 7 to see and compare um, the differences in, obviously, I think the best way to determine the performance of a phone is to actually render something. And I currently think the Google VR um, is going to be an upcoming platform that's going to be pretty prominent. Now, one thing that I offer in this is I think is kind of cool. I have little virtual joystick buttons. And if you're using my Neody VR Uplay, you can actually slide your fingers up and even though you have it in front of your eyes, you can actually use it to move around. So I'm going to offer that. And if you notice, after a few seconds, it goes away so it doesn't spoil your VR, but still gives you the ability to manipulate around in a VR setting. You see that, Chris? Kind of mm -hmm. cool, huh? Yeah, amazing. So, um, And I like this demo because it really shows off some of the shaders and use a ton of what they call... Uh, I'm kidding. Uh, like reflection balls, and they capture the room environment and then apply that to the shaders so that it gives it a very metallic or glossy experience. So look at that there. I mean, don't you get the, don't you feel like that's actually metal? I, I like this one too. Let me jump back a little bit. Uh, okay. And rotate around. Uh. I find it a little easier to manage when you have it on front of you. Okay, so let's go down this hallway. Okay, so look at this statue here. Whoops. What do you think of that? So one of the things that I find pretty cool about the Unreal Engine is its ability to really create very realistic rendering. The problem is in a mobile environment, it's very difficult to uh, obtain this with any real good frame rates. And I'm hoping with the next iteration of Snapdragon, um, as well as other chips, maybe from NVIDIA, uh, that we'll start to see some real performance in mobile and provide very realistic environments. Obviously, this is a very sophisticated scene. And I knew that coming into it that I would have very poor frame update. Um, but the fact is the shaders look just wonderful. And having this in front of your eyes really immerses you. And you really feel like you're in this environment. Should add a few, you know, we were talking about sound. I think that's extremely important. There is none in here, but I was thinking as you're moving, because it's like a large temple, you should have some reverberation so that when you're moving, it'll echo off the walls. So. I look forward to playing with that. That is also uh, available in the Unreal Engine. So there you go. Kind of cool, huh? Awesome. Awesome. So that's it from the Splunking. Uh, as you know, I have my head buried in the, the sand a lot and come up for air once in a while to bring out these little goodies. And Chris, I really appreciate on your part, Mr. Print Whisper, um, and all your little tips. I learned something new. Plus, a new little scanning application this week. All right, so a couple other things to talk about, and then we'll end the show. Let me jump back to my screen. What's going on? We're back in September, and uh, we should be able to actually see some new shows going on in the month of September. If you're in Germany, there's the IFA, which just happened. Had some cool announcements uh, that were talked about. In fact, uh, you mentioned one of them last week, which is the Qualcomm reference uh, VR headset. Uh, that came out of IFA. Uh, on September 16, if you're in the uh, Ukraine, you can go to the 3D print conference. And then obviously later in the month, we have something in Switzerland, the Additive Manufacturing Expo. 
Uh, I heard that this one's a pretty good show. Sadly, I can't afford to go. And then later in the month, we have China, which we'll cover again uh, and repeat it uh, several times. What do we have on Road to VR? <laughs> Nothing. Um, I don't. They, they were updating this calendar quite frequently, but uh, either we don't have any shows, and actually I do know that there'll be a show later in September, and then obviously there's the Google event in October early, and then there's also a event up in uh, Vancouver, if I remember correctly, Canada, big expo, or maybe Toronto, uh, Toronto VR uh, in October as well. So I'll find the dates for that and mention them next week. So that's about it on the calendars. Chris, you want to end the show? All right. Well, thank you to uh, all of our wonderful content providers, including National Geographic, Google, Samsung, Apple, Adobe, Wacom, NASA, uh, and more. You can find additional credits in hey, the show Hey, don't notes. forget Neody VR you play. Sponsored or Neody VR, <laughs> sponsored by, uh, you know, in UploadVR.com, 3D Hubs, and uh, we will see you next week on another episode of All Things 3D. Bye.